of the vertices that preserves the edges. Um, and so this is the most important isomorphism problem because it is, in a very specific sense, a universal isomorphism problem, meaning if we can solve graph isomorphism in polynomial time, then um, we can solve isomorphism of, of explicit combinatorial structures, which has a precise definition, but I don't want to get into it, uh, in polynomial time for any uh, um, and the best known algorithm uh, right now for uh, graph isomorphism run from time n to the square root of n, uh, where n is the number of vertices. Um, and uh, it, it has, uh, it, uh, it has uh, applications uh, in practice, but it's also, I think, uh, of uh, very interesting complexity theoretic status. Let me talk about that for a second. Um, so in computational complexity, we believe the world uh, looks something like this. Um, so NP is the class of problems that can be solved in non-deterministic polynomial time. If you don't know what it is, it doesn't matter too much. But NP is the class of problems that can be solved in polynomial time. So those are the problems that can be solved efficiently. Um, and then uh, NPC here is the class of NP-complete problems. These are problems that are as hard as any other problem in NP. Meaning that if we could solve any one problem that's NP complete in polynomial time, then we can solve every problem in NP in polynomial time. Um, we can't show that uh, P is different from NP. Uh, that's one of the biggest open problems. Uh, but um, but so, so the, the goal would be, but, but so proving that something is NP complete is, is as well as we can do in terms of proving that something is solved. Uh, and graph isomorphism was uh, one of the problems uh, that when NP was first defined um, was sort of, um, the question was, where does it lie in this picture? And we still don't know too much about it, um, but we do know a little bit more. We know that it lies inside a class called CoAM, which means that we believe it is not NP complete. So it is likely not to be NP complete, but we still don't know whether it's NP or not. And, and this is really the only uh, natural problem that uh, has this complexity uh, status. And so that's why it's a particularly uh, interesting no problem. problem with this in MP? You no, know, we don't. Yes. I mean, it, it could be, uh, but it could also not be. And there are, if P is different from MP, we know that there are infinitely many sort of classes in between. So it could also lie somewhere in the middle. But, uh. Okay, so historically, sorry, AM is for Arthur Merlin. Uh, it's sort of a randomized version of MP. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a yeah, I don't, I don't realize it. those are my wife's initials. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to speak to you after. I don't know. <laughs> This seminar is kind of crazy. <laughs> okay, so um, the first techniques that people used for, for graph isomorphism were combinatorial heuristics. The idea is you, you partition your graph by, say, the degree, and then you refine this partition. But if you start with a graph that's, say, regular, like this graph, you're, you're staring at it, and you can't find any inhomogeneity. Um, so what can you do? Well, one thing you can do is you can color a vertex with a special color and then hope that this smashes your graph into lots of pieces. Um, now, however, if you, when you color this vertex, you need to try every possibility on the other graph for coloring the vertex. So this comes at a multiplicative factor of n in the cost. Um, 
However, somewhat surprisingly perhaps, these very simple techniques provably work in a lot of cases. They work in linear time for almost all graphs. Um, and for strongly regular graphs, which is an important class of graphs because they have a lot of uh, symmetry, uh, they work in uh, the spiel improved in a, in a non trivial work that really shows the power of these techniques. Uh, about a running time that's exponential in the cube root of it. Uh, so that's better than the general graph as it works that. And this combines the combinatorial techniques and the proof uses uh, some linear algebra. And However, in general, uh, they require exponential time. So Tsai Fir and Immerman showed examples of uh, classes of graphs that are not isomorphic, but that these techniques take exponential time to distinguish. So what else can we do? Um, in 1979, Babai introduced uh, group theory to uh, the isomorphism testing uh, problems. And the first application was a polynomial time algorithm for graphs with bounded color classes. Um, so that simply means that uh, the vertices have colors, and the colors must be respected by the isomorphism. But there are only a bounded number of uh, vertices of each color. And uh, actually, it's interesting that the Cypher and Immerman graphs have color class size 4. So already this first uh, use of group theory beats the combinatorial techniques by an exponential gap. Um, there are further applications to other classes of graphs. And really, the uh, crowning achievement of the group theoretic methods was Lotz's algorithm that works in polynomial time for bounded degree graphs. And uh, these techniques were, were used for other results and uh, eventually uh, using a combination of the group theoretic techniques and a combinatorial trick by Zemlyachenko, this led to the best known algorithm for uh, all graphs which runs in time exponential and square root of the tildes throughout my talk are going to hide uh, some polylogarithmic factors. OK, so, so that's sort of an overview. And it's not a complete history, but it's just an overview of uh, graph isomorphism. Um, what I want to talk about, um, what I, the results to talk about, is hypergraph isomorphism. Here we're given two hypergraphs. Hypergraphs are set systems. Um, and uh, the rank of the hypergraph is the size of a, the, the maximum size of a set, uh, which I will also call hyperedges or edges. Uh, and if, if we have a hypergraph of rank 2, then it's a graph. Um, so for bounded rank, we match the uh, running time for graphs. So it's exponential and square root of n up to some log pattern. And uh, this sort of answers an old question, and um, yeah, as I said, it matches the best known bound graphs for graph results. OK. The best previous bound, even for rank 3, was constant to 8. What is rank? Uh, the rank is the maximum size of a hyperage. So a hypergraph. Is, is something, it's a bunch of vertices and then some sets. So it generalizes the graph because in a graph the sets all have size 2. In hypergraph they're arbitrary size. If we limit the maximum size of a set, that's the rank. So this is a rank 3 hypergraph. A graph is a rank 2 hypergraph. Um, of course, we can't hope to beat constant to the n in general because uh, the input size is, is 2 to the n, potentially, because there could be that many subsets. OK. Um, so why do why, why care about hypergraph isomorphism? Um, and, and why do we care about these types of running times first? So first of all, um, let me talk about what moderately exponential time is. In general, uh, NP problems are defined we have an input. And then we have a witness space, and we're searching over witnesses. Um, 
And usually, typically, the size of the witness space is exponential in the size of the input. Um, so exhaustive search is going to take exponential time. Moderately exponential time is something that reduces the exponent on the size of the witness space. And often, getting a moderately exponential time requires some non-trivial insight. Um, so for graph isomorphism or hypergraph isomorphism, moderately exponential time is something that's exponential in n to the 1 minus c for some constant. Because the witness space is size and factorial. Okay. So, the question of finding moderately exponential time algorithms for bounded rank hypergraphs was first raised in 83 by Mobile and Locks. And then it was reiterated by Locks in the uh, paper where he proved uh, the exponential time algorithm, simple exponential algorithm. And more precisely, our result for k hypergraphs, rank k hypergraphs, it's time k exponential in k squared squared. So it's actually moderately exponential even for super constant. Okay, so maybe, uh, so, so still you might only really care about the graph isomorphism problem. You think whatever hypergraph isomorphism is sort of not as interesting. Um, but I want to try and convince you that actually it still matters. So the, the big open problem is to get a better algorithm for graph isomorphism, say exponential and, and to the point formula. If we had such an algorithm for graph isomorphism, then we would have an algorithm for four hypergraph isomorphism time n to the point nine eight. This is a relatively easy reduction. Um, and so our result removes, this can be seen sort of a, as an obstacle to improving the graph isomorphism uh, because uh, the current class is exponential in square root. And so our result removes this potential opposite. Okay, so what, what sort of one of the one of the key ideas was to combine the, the, the combinatorics and the group theory techniques. So before, um, so Lux's result and, uh, uses essentially only group theory methods. And uh, then the best algorithm for graph isomorphism has a combinatorial part that's just a fairly simple trick, and then it, and then it reduces to the group theory. So we're, we're, in our work, we sort of intertwine the two, and we use both throughout. Um, and this was done, uh, the first demo of, of using both of them was in the original paper with, in an algorithm that got n to the square root of n for bounded degree graphs. Of course, this was later improved by Locks. Um, but so we revived this, this, this basic idea. Let me just uh, set up some notation. Uh, SN is going to be the symmetric group A and the alternating group. Um, and in, in computation, permutation groups will be given by lists of generators. And we can perform basic tasks in polynomial time. Um, and, and some non-basic tasks. Um, the automorphism group of, of any structure is, is a, a permutation group. And the set of isomorphisms is either empty or a coset of the isomorphisms. An important related problem is the coset intersection problem. So here we're given two cosets uh, in the symmetric group, and we want to know whether or not their intersection is empty. And Lux proved that uh, if we can solve the coset intersection problem, then we can solve the graph isomorphism problem on one time. That's what the <coughs> car production means. Can you say it again? If we can so see. if we can solve coset intersection in polynomial, time. in polynomial time, in time t of n, then we can solve graph isomorphism in time t of n choose 2. But how do you measure complexity of the inputs for a coset intersection problem? The, the, the n. n is the only parameter. So I does not depend on the subgroup? So no. I mean, if, if you have special structure of the subgroups, you can do better, uh, potentially. But uh, uh, 
in, you want to do it independently. So, so the input here is the cosets are given by lists of generators of the subgroups mm -hmm. and, and the coset wrap. Mm -hmm. So you're given uh, sigma and tau, and you're given uh, lists of generators for G and lists of generators for H. Uh, so how, how big can um, the, the number so, of generators so be? The number of generators is logarithmic in uh, Sorry, no, 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 it's, it's, it's an N, so uh, order N. There's always seven kilometers. And, and. But uh, the, the coset, the number of cosets is uh, exponential? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ah, but you're, uh, okay. We, so you're just we're, just, we're just asking whether the intersection is empty. Mm -hmm. or, or, or finding the intersection. So all we have to do is to solve this decision problem. Right. right. If, if we solve this decision problem, then we solve the graph as a morphism problem. Mm -hmm. now, in graph as a morphism, actually, the decision problem or the problem of finding is is the the, the whole set of all isomorphisms are equivalent. Mm -hmm. This is not true, for example, for group isomorphism, or at least we don't. Know. Okay. So. Following the, the algorithm that's exponential and square root for graph isomorphism, uh, Bobai proved them, uh, an algorithm for coset intersection in time with exponential and square root of uh, And we're going to use this tool to amplify the power of partitioning and refinement, and it will allow us to reduce the highly regular structures. And let me explain a little bit more what I mean by that. So uh, let's, let's look at. Uh, our graph, and then we select some invariant. For example, the number of triangles that an edge participates in. And then this uh, maybe breaks up our graph, and we color it. So we partition our graph into parts. The red part and the blue part. And we can do the same thing for the other graph. Why? If, if, if they're different, maybe there are more red edges in, in Y than there are in X, then they're not as more because this was an invariant. Otherwise, uh, the isomorphism is simply the intersection of uh, the isomorphism on, on each of the parts. So the isomorphism of the red edges and the isomorphism of the blue edges. Thinking of, of, of these as, as graphs of the same sets of vertices. So uh, what did this get us? So we can, we can perform this, this coset intersection operation now, uh, at least some number of times. And what's the advantage now? The advantage is that the xi and y are homogeneous with respect to this invariant. So we, we, here, what have we done? We've reduced to uh, per, performing uh, isomorphism of graphs where all edges participate in the same number of triangles. And so, of course, this can be done in, in, in a very uh, much more in depth, and we will uh, end up with really highly regular structures. Um, so, so let me talk about hypergraphs now. Um, so we actually, uh, for somewhat technical reasons, switch to k-partite hypergraphs. This is a generalization of bipartite graphs. So we have k parts. And the edges are simply transversals, so they pick one vertex from each of the parts. Um, and we can partition our uh, hyper edges by generalized degree. Um, so here, uh, there are four hyper edges here, one, two, three, four, and three up there. So this vertex sort of has a degree that's different than this vertex in some sense. So we color them differently and partition and apply coset intersection. The structure that we obtain, we call it fully regular. It's not just regular would mean that all of the vertices have the same number of edges. Here, all partial edges have the same number of continuations. Another uh, <coughs> thing we can do, we, we, we look at a partial edge on all but two of the parts. So all of the continuations of it define a bipartite graph, a residual bipartite graph. 
And now we can use the algorithm for graph isomorphism and cosine intersection to reduce to the case where all of these residual bipartite graphs are isomorphic. So we're imposing a lot of structure on our Okay, so now, that, so, so up to now, these have been sort of fairly combinatorial things combined with cosine intersection. Still, we're doing things separately. So let me talk about the, the, the group methods for a second. So for the purpose of recursion, we want to generalize the problem to the problem of G isomorphism. This is where we're looking for isomorphisms within some group G. And we will use as a measure of progress a reduction in G. Once G is a subgroup of the automorphism group of X, we're done because either the two graphs are equal, not just isomorphic, but equal, or they're not G isomorphic. That's, that's what uh, it means for G. Okay, so now um, Lux divides the divide and conquer uh, scheme that allows us to uh, look at each of the orbits of G separately. So if, if G has orbits on this first part, um, then we simply look at them one at a time. And so we, we simply consider the case where G is transitive on each of the parts. And this reduction actually works in the near term. So. The second uh, step of Lux's reduction has to do with primitive groups. A uh, primitive group is one that has no G invariant partition. Um, and primitive groups, uh, primitive subgroups of, of the symmetric group, so primitive subgroups of degree K are either the symmetric group or the alternating group, or they have moderately exponential size. So the size of the most exponential and square root of K. Um, the alternating group of the symmetric group has size factorial. So. so there's a big gap. So either there's a lot of structure or they're small, relatively small. And this is actually tight, and this is probably the biggest bottleneck in the current isomorphism techniques for graphs. Or one of them. <laughs> there are others. Okay, so so how can we use this? Well Lux has uh, the following idea, um, suppose, so we're looking for isomorphisms within the, the group G. And now we find some subgroup H, um, and we look at all the cosets. Then we can simply uh, find the isomorphism by taking the union of our representatives uh, of the isomorphism within each of the cosets. That's just partitioning G and When do we actually use this? Suppose we have an imprimitive G action. So there's a, a invariant partition of the domain. Um, then H will be the kernel of the primitive action on a minimal block system. Um, and in H, the blocks turn into orbits. This is sort of the key point. Um, and so we can apply the divide and conquer for each of these instances. So um, let's look at what, what this gets us. So suppose we have B blocks, and P is the primitive action on, on the blocks. Um, H is the kernel, and we take a set of reps. Now, if we apply the, the green formula up there, what is the timing going to be? Well, we take a union over the size of the primitive action, uh, times we have each of the instance breaks up into B orbits, each of size n over B. And when is this helpful? Suppose that we have some bound uh, on the size of the primitive group we're considering, of the form B to the S, then, then this is going to be effective. And in fact, uh, the, the bounded degree graph isomorphism algorithm by Lux motivated uh, the bicamera and Palfi is bound on groups whose alternating sections are bounded. So, so this actually, using this theorem then gives a 
simpler algorithm for graphism. Okay, but going back to such a bound, suppose we have such a bound, what do we get? Uh, then we get that the timing is n to the s, essentially. So this is okay as long as s is square root of n, where n is the initial number of vertices. Then we can afford to, to do this. this. And so, so we will use a primitive bound, and so as long as we don't have alternating or symmetric groups, we can apply this 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 end. So we call the symmetric and the alternating groups on at least two square root of n vertices giants. N is, is a global parameter, it's the initial number of vertices. Because everything else is small. So Lux's divide and conquer stops when we have a giant action on the blocks in each part. And really, the mo the, our technical contribution is handling these giants. OK, so what's the situation, just to recap? We have k parts. We have blocks in each of the parts. Um, and there is, a, let's say, alternating group acting on each of the parts. And now, then, uh, this means that it's actually a direct product of diagonal actions. Um, so we have, some parts are linked. These red parts are linked and the green linked. And the others are not linked. And then the linked parts move together and everything else moves arbitrarily. That's the group action. And our goal is to, to break this, this apparent symmetry. So it looks like uh, the alternating group is acting. Is it, is it, if we need to break this to reduce the group G. OK, so how do we do this? Well, we were looking for these splits. Um, a split is simply an inhomogeneity, num a different number of edges, something like that. Um, and we call a split relatives if it follows some individualization. So maybe after, so if we look at those things that follow these, uh, this partial edge, then we have a split. Um, and it's absolute if there is no individualization required. If the split is large, then the multiplicative cost for individualization is OK. We can afford to individualize. Otherwise, we need to somehow either make the split bigger or reduce the cost of individualization. So let me try and, and give you a flavor of how we do this, this amplification. Um, and, um, so let's just look at uh, three uh, tripartite, a three hypergraph, and assume that the parts are not linked. Um, now we look at a residual bipartite graph. So we fix one vertex and look at all of the hyper edges that go through this vertex. This defines a bipartite graph, and we compute the automorphism group of this graph. And suppose we find a split. Maybe it's an orbit in the automorphism group. Uh, if it's a large split, then we're done, because we can individualize. But what if it's a small split? Well, then remember that all of these residual bipartite graphs are isomorphic. So we have a split for each of the other ones as well. Now let's look at the blocks. The blocks are small because the action is giant. So the action is at least square root of n. So each of the blocks is less than square root of n. And the splits are small. So they're less than a square root of n fraction. So we can take the union, and this will give us a, a proper uh, bipartite graph, meaning it, it has less than half density. Um, and we get a, a bipartite graph between the blocks. What can we do with that? Well, let's compute the automorphism. And now um, let's look at the action of this automorphism group on each part. If it's not transitive, this is an absolute split. Now. Um, if it's transitive but not giant, then this gives us a large reduction in the group. Um, but what if it's giant? Then we need a combinatorial lemma that tells us that if we have a, a biregular bipartite graph and the alternating group is acting on both of the sides, then the graph is either uh, empty, a matching, or the complement of these graphs. So what happens if, if, if the, the, the automorphism group is actually a giant? Then why is a matching? Because we know that it, it has at least one edge and it has density less than Okay, so, so, so this weird graph that we constructed was a matching. What does that buy us? Then we get new linking. 
we previously did not think these two parts were linked, but now they are linked because it's a, it's a matching. So the two, the two parts must have the same number of blocks, and they are linked. OK, so this is also a great reduction in the size of it. OK, so hopefully you got some sense of, of the types of things that we're doing. Um, we have a lot of uh, symmetry breaking strategies. Some of them I talked about, some of them I didn't. Um, and what's, what's the point, right? So, so we keep reducing uh, the group, we keep breaking this apparent symmetry. Uh, the goal is to eventually reach the ultimate structure. So what does that mean? It means eventually uh, we, we will reach graphs where the automorphism group actually does have a giant action on each of the parts or blocks. Right? So what do such graphs look like? Well, they will have disconnected components that are small. These will be the blocks. Um, and so these are linked blocks across different parts. And there will be several of these for different parts. And then between them, they will have all possible edges. Except if the parts are linked, like here, but there are no edges across, then there, there are all of the edges except the ones across. So, so we know exactly this, this structure, and we can compute the isomorphism of such structures, because essentially it reduces the computing isomorphism of these small things, which are sized most of them, which we can do by group forms. Okay, and otherwise, if it doesn't look like this, we constructively disprove the giant action using our symmetry breaking strategy. Maybe one of these edges is missing. But that means that the action here is not giant because this guy looks different from this guy. And so on. OK, so now I can sort of give you the algorithm in full. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, this is the end of this part, so if you have questions. <laughs> okay, so then uh, I will move on now, I will sort of change pace, talk about a, a group isomorphism problem. Um, and so this, this problem, so in, in the hypergraph isomorphism problem, we started off from a combinatorial problem and we used group theory and combinatorics to solve it. Group isomorphism, we're starting off from a, from a group theory problem, and we'll end up using some more combinatorial tools this way. So once again, about these cosets. Yeah. So the problem about two cosets being equal or uh, being uh, intersecting or not, it uh, boils down to uh, the membership problem in the subgroup, right? No, it's, it's, well, it's, it's much harder. Two sets can be, belong to different subgroups. Yeah. And that's well, they are courses with respect so to the same subgroup. Right? No, two different subgroups. Two different ah, subgroups. Different you just have the knowledge that uh, they are courses. Mm. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, group by some and I will be talking about finite. Um, so we're given two groups, and we want to know whether they're isomorphic. What do I mean, uh, <coughs> given two groups? Um, for, for now, I mean given by multiplication tables, being very generous. So uh, given uh, the input size is n squared, where n is the order. And the goal is, is polynomial time. So there are finite groups. Finite groups, yes. Yeah, because I, I, I give you the Cayley table. Has to be fine. Uh, and the goal is polynomial time, which, which seems fairly modest, but this is actually a pretty hard problem. Uh, so, uh, what can we do? First of all, note that if we're given a bijection between generators, then it's easy to test the next, whether it extends. So, if the group in question has k generators, then by exhaustive search, we have n to the k cases. And uh, every group is generated by most log n, where n, n now is going to be the order of the group for the rest of the group. And so this gives an n to the log n algorithm that not just uh, finds the set of isomorphisms, but lists all isomorphisms. 
for many important classes of groups, uh, for example, simple groups, uh, this gives a polynomial type. Um, there, there are various known practical heuristic algorithms. I just put one up there, so I, I don't intend to give a full review of the literature here. That would be way too much. But I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Why, why is it polynomial time of k is two? Sorry. Why is it polynomial time of k? So if k is two, what you do is you simply look at you, you try every possible mapping of the two generators to the other group, and check whether that extends to an isomorphism. And so it's special about two. Oh, uh, nothing. It's constant. <laughs> Two is, is some constant. Is a constant. So it could be any constant. And still yes, for any constant, this would be <laughs> polynomial time. For the symmetric group and for simple groups, the constant is 2. So. <laughs> okay, so. So other than, than the practical algorithms from the theoretical side, what we know is the abelian case is easy. But just one step away from abelian are, are class two nilpotent groups, and these are, are sort of considered to be the hardest uh, case. Um, there is no complete structure theory known for these algorithms, and, and Wilson has some uh, work in this direction. Uh, yeah, our goal is to uh, formalize the fact that this case is the, the chief model. Uh, the nilpotent case is the chief model. Um, ideally, we would have a, a reduction to the nilpotent case. But what we want to really capture is the fact that abelian normal subgroups are obstacles. So we look at semi-simple groups. These are groups that have no abelian normal subgroups, non-trivial. So uh, the, our, our first, uh, one can notice that actually for semi-simple groups, we can get the test uh, of isomorphism that runs in time into the log log n. Uh, and in fact, it lists all of the isomorphisms. So this proves that the number of automorphisms is at most into the log log n for this class of groups. So what well, is this first statement? Yeah. If G is semi-simple, then the automorphism group the size of most yes. into the log. So, well, what is the, 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 the BCJ cube? The same thing? Oh, yeah, yeah, same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but now, actually, we know that we can test as more than a semi simple groups in polynomial. Um, and there are sort of three main ingredients there's some group theoretic reductions, uh, and then go. Oh, the permutational isomorphism of permutation groups and code equivalents. These two last problems are, are of independent interest and they have a more combinatorial flavor, especially code equivalents. Um, so I'm going to try and give you uh, a sense of, first of all, uh, how these problems come up, especially the permutational isomorphism problem, um, and um, then state, state what our results are. Okay, so. Uh, rad is going to be the solvable radical, the largest uh, solvable normal subgroup. Um, and for every group, G by the radical is semi-simple. So this is uh, another reason to, to look at semi-simple groups. We sort of have to if we want to get the general. Um, SOC is going to be the SOCL, uh, the product of the minimal normal subgroups. And for semi-simple groups, the SOCL is the direct product of non-abelian simple groups. And then um, <laughs> we can look at the conjugation action uh, of the group on the simple factors. Uh, this gives us uh, a permutation kernel, which is simply the kernel of this action. So, so this. Um, this is a chain of characteristic subgroups of our group. Um, what was this so called the star? So Sokol star um, is, is defined by, by this line. Um, so it's, it's the pre-image of and, and in general, 
uh, sock star uh, by rad g is the product of the abelian simple groups. Okay, so, so these things can be defined in general, not just for uh, semi simple groups. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and this sort of summarizes um, what I said earlier about um, semi simple groups. Um, so we have the radical g, which is 1. Uh, the Sockel is, uh, so, so here I'm, um, uh, on this side I'm, I'm putting in the quotients. So the Sockel is just the direct product of non-abelian simple factors. P curved by the Sockel is the direct product of the outer automorphisms of these non-abelian simple groups. And G by P curve is a permutation group of degree K, where K is the number of these uh, simple factors, and there are at most log of the order of g by log 60 of these simple factors. So we have a permutation group of degree that's logarithmic. So we have these, these non-abelian simple things and something that's uh, a small permutation, small degree permutation. Okay, so, um, so this is where the permutational isomorphism problem comes in. What, what do we want out of these permutation groups? We want, uh, so we say that two permutation groups are permutationally isomorphic. If there is some um, permutation that conjugates one to the other. So this means that we're mapping the domain. So because G by Peaker is, is uh, permutation group of degree that's logarithmic, we need an algorithm that decides permutational isomorphism in time uh, constant to the k, that's the degree, and polynomial in the order. And, and the, the key step from, from the old paper to the new paper was that actually we can do this. And, uh, oh. and so now I want to, uh, so of course just doing this is not enough because we had all those other layers. So let me at least uh, try and give you a sense of a little bit of why that outer automorphism layer goes away. Um, so that's basically based on this lemma. Um, so if we have normal subgroup, so if we have two groups, G and H, and normal subgroups R and S that have trivial centralizers. Um, then we can look at the, the faithful permutation representation of these groups by conjugation. Um, and then an isomorphism between the subgroups extends to an isomorphism of the bigger groups, even only if it is a permutational isomorphism of these images. So this was our lemma. In particular, this also means that such an isomorphism extends in at most one way. And if it given one f, we can decide if uh, the extension exists in polynomial and find it. Uh, in particular, this, this uh, almost immediately implies that for semi-simple groups, we can list all isomorphisms in time onto the log log n. Uh, this is because we can list the isomorphisms of the Sockel in time and to the log log. Um, note that essentially, okay, so once we, we've done this, um, so the isomorphisms of the Sockel uh, as uh, what does the sample look like? It looks like T1 across Tk. These are the simple factors. So what, what's an isomorphism of the sample going to do? It's going to permute these factors. That's the permutation action. And then it's going to perform some automorphism on these factors as it permutes them. Um, so we can fix, recall that each of the simple groups 
can be generated by just two generators. So we can fix generators for each of them. Try every possible set of generators. This is at most n squared choices. Because uh, at most, or we're picking, so each, each non-abelian simple group has at most the order of the group. So, um, sorry, the whole thing has at most the order of the group. Um, and once we fix these, all that's left is a permutation. So that's sort of why we can reduce the permutation after we do this step. The details are actually not quite so simple, and we need we need actually code equivalents as well in this reduction. Okay, so just one more thing: our, our, the permutationalized morphism result that we actually use in our reduction is only for transitive groups. For transitive groups, we can actually list all isomorphism in time that's constant to the k times the order. Um, and the, the bound on the order is tight up to a factor of square root of log k here in the exponent. Um, and in the intransitive case, we actually reduce the code So what's this code equivalence I said a bunch of times now? Um, oh, yeah, the last thing. There's no reason why, so if we look at the permutation isomorphism problem in isolation, not within our context, so this is good enough for us. But there's no reason why this, this polynomial factor in G should be there. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's reasonable to ask if we can get something that's exponential in the degree, or maybe even exponential in the square root of the degree, something like that. We probably can't get better than exponential in the square root of the degree without, you know, so we can't get better than, uh, so we can't hope for, say, polynomial time in the degree, because that would also get polynomial time for graph isomorphism. So I mean, we can hope, but uh, very hard. OK, so code equivalent. What's a code, first of all? It's a string um, over some alphabet. Uh, of, and it, the code is of length r if this, sorry. The code is not a string. It's a set of strings of length r over some alphabet. Uh, and two codes are equivalent if there's a bijection of the domains that, that takes the two the, that maps the two sets of states. And our algorithm um, uh, tests equivalence of codes of length r in time that's constant in the length and polynomial in the size of the code and the size of the alphabet. And this is, is somehow uh, inspired by Lux's dynamic programming algorithm for hypergraph isomorphism. Um, and it generalizes it because a hypergraph is a code over a binary alphabet. OK, so, so this is our algorithm. But actually, the, the types of codes that arise in our applications have a very special structure. The alphabet is a group, and the code is a subgroup. Um, so now, the code can be succinctly represented by generators. And can we uh, not have this dependence on uh, the size of the code and the size of the alphabet? And for, for linear codes, that's when gamma is zp, this is solved. Um, but basically, we don't know anything else. So let me uh, leave some open problems here. Uh, a simple one is, is well, a small one is, can we improve our dependence on k in the hypergraph isomorphism algorithm? So k was the rank. Um, the bigger one is to improve the graph isomorphism algorithm. Um, another big problem is, is group isomorphism in polynomial time. Um, maybe for, as a start, we can get the reduction to the Newtonian case. Um, and can we do permutational isomorphism without having this polynomial dependence on the order of the groups? And uh, group code equivalents. Uh, we know it for ZP. It's open even for cyclic or... So 
just to make sure, yeah. uh, what's the best known result for uh, graph isomers? Two, uh, two, two to the square root of n? Uh, n to the square root of n. Yeah. Oh, so when you write uh, x, that means n to the... Well, uh, so 0.49 is, is arbitrary, so... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, X means E, but, but, it, but it, if it's, if it's point 0.49, it could be uh, N to the point 0.491 time instead of point 0.49 times log N. So. No, I'm talking about the base of the exponent. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. Any, any base would be, would be great. No, because, and, and with, with as many log factors as you want. Also. Right. Because, because... Uh, oh, you're up yeah. to the log factor. Yeah. Okay. Because then you can just add one and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. epsilon to the other one. Yeah. Um, just a couple of questions. So when you have a, <coughs> when you have a group, you can have the tail graph, right? Mm -hmm. So then can't you use the techniques you used to graph isomorphism well? so to, to solve this? So the Cayley graph well. depends on the specific choice of generators. Uh, so uh, so, so you can't just uh, find a Cayley graph and find the Cayley graph for the other group because you might have chosen the generator such that the Cayley graphs are not isomorphic, but the groups are. Yeah. And the other thing is that um, that would give us an algorithm that runs in time n to the square root of n. So there, there is a reduction from group isomorphism to to graph isomorphism, um, but it, it's it's not via Cayley graphs, but, but uh, essentially you look at uh, you can think of it as a reduction to say hypergraph isomorphism, a colored hypergraph, where you look at the triples of uh, that form multiplication. So if a times b equals c, then you put the hyper edge that's a, b, and c in that order, so ordered hypergraph. Uh, and then uh, isomorphism of the hypergraphs correspond to isomorphism of the groups. Uh, but um, first, so this is, uh, but, but we know a much better algorithm already for group isomorphism. So it's n to the log n as opposed to n to the square root. So group isomorphism is, is easier than, than graph isomorphism. Although there, there have been approaches that try to reduce it to graph isomorphism for smaller graphs, or for graphs with more structure that we already know how to solve, say, bounded with three graphs or something like that. It's, so it's, it, one could try to do something. The other question, um, you mentioned that the given group is, um, the representation you gave was the mod is a multiplication table. Mm -hmm. If you change it, say, to um, group uh, presentation, do you think it's going to change or doesn't apply to Well, the problem, if you're given, so if, you're, if, you're, if we're given generators in some way or something like a matrix group or a permutation group, then we can compute the, the multiplication table. Okay, so you're already um, reading Right, as long as we can compute the, the multiplication table, then. Mm. So I guess it's just There seems to be some kind of an embedding property lurking, an efficient embedding property lurking in the background about symmetric groups um, of uh, various objects, uh, how closely you can pack them into a... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of these things are about... So, so a lot of these reductions between them are, are about that. And how sensitive is the reduction when you individualize? then you are essentially choosing a base point in topological language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that is known how it affects your reduction process? That's so so this, this, this depends yeah. on the specific reduction. So yeah. there are reductions. So there are reductions that are one-to-one, -one, mm -hmm. where every point here corresponds to a point here, and then that is, is yeah. well-defined. There are reductions that are more complicated, and then the interaction will be mm -hmm. different. So, so that uh, that will depend on the specific production. No other question. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again.